Chapter 59 The Green Dragon For a second Lydia couldn't understand why the ground was getting further away. Her ribs and her hips hurt. That was a clue. The shade under the enormous beast above her was the giveaway. A dragon had grabbed her from the balcony. She considered her options as Shakika disappeared behind her, and the mountains north of the city loomed ahead. Her old magic powers had dwindled, so they were not to be relied on. She had her wand, and her high magic was as strong as ever. Unfortunately, it was not powerful enough to be of much use against a dragon. Ambrose had taught her a healthy respect for dragons. Presumably the Watcher had sent this one. It would not be on her side. She had a broom in her rucksack. Then she realised the straps were not over her shoulders. She must have dropped it. It had been in her hand. She had been about to sling it over her shoulder. She had let go when the dragon had grabbed her. With a sickening lurch she remembered Xander had been in the bag too. She prayed he was all right. She hoped it had fallen on the balcony. In frustrated anger she twisted as much as she could to get a better view of the dragon. Its underbelly was a yellowish white, but she could see enough to tell that the rest of it was green. Ambrose had always said that green dragons were perfidious and she should never trust them. He had told her as a little girl how a green dragon had cheated him in a game of poker, by hiding cards between its scales. It was a silly story, of course, but it was part of the education he had given her by stealth. Now she thought about it, it was possible it was not just a funny fable with a point. Perhaps he had played poker with the dragon. Everything about Ambrose was so complicated. The dragon swept its wings tirelessly, and the wind howled around her. She knew dragons flew more by magic and by aerodynamics, but this one was putting on a good show. The northern mountains grew ever closer. She wondered what the dragon was planning for her. Why had it not killed her? A blast of its breath would have disposed of her and her friends. The dragon's claws could have torn her apart. So why were they flying towards the mountains? The dragon banked steeply to the left, and circled down towards the snow-capped peaks below. In a moment it was flying straight at the mountainside. It pulled up at the last second, and she saw the cavern. The dragon flew inside and dropped Lydia on a ledge at the mouth of the broad cave. The dragon landed deftly, and turned to face her. "'Welcome to one of my humble abodes,' the dragon rumbled. "'There is a sheer drop behind you. If you attempt to escape, you risk being dashed on the rocks below. I would probably catch you before that happened, but I would not recommend you try. The magic of your world is weak here. It will not aid you. Mine is strong. You could not pass through the entrance if you tried. Only I can help you now, Lydia Ward. Lydia, she retorted. Lydia's the other girl. She was inside when you flew past. I'm Shona, Shona Ogden. I'm afraid you have the wrong person, Lord Dragon. The dragon chuckled. It was so deep it made the floor shake. Oh, oh, oh. oh little Miss Ward, the dragon said. Well, it is true that I have never seen you before. I can see things many others cannot. Such a thing is the crown of the Queen of the Thousand Forests. That is how I know you to be Lydia Ward. Besides, Shona is the pretty one. May I ask, are you a female dragon? Lydia probed. As it happens, I am, the dragon replied. What's the term for a lady dragon? Lydia pondered. Is it a sow or a bitch? Oh, good, the dragon gloated. It seems I've touched a nerve. This is going to be less tedious than I had feared. What do you want with me? Lydia challenged. This dragon was annoying her now. It made no sense to be annoyed at several tons of magical muscle, claws and teeth. It made even less sense when she considered the fire-breathing ability. But here she was, annoyed. She feared for Xander. She worried for the rest of her friends. And the success of the quest hung in the balance. I thought I would invite you to stay for a few days, the dragon replied. 
that should be long enough. After that, if you are lucky, I shall eat you. And if I'm unlucky? she asked. She regretted asking. The alternative was never likely to be good. If it was worse than being eaten by a dragon. We have a mutual acquaintance who might wish to entertain you for a while, the dragon said. So you're just working for the Watcher, Didier asked. Where I come from, the dragons are proud and noble creatures, not servants. The dragon's silence felt loaded with danger. It was long enough to be more than uncomfortable. Huh, the dragon remarked. She turned her back on Lydia and curled her tail around herself under her folded wings. Lydia breathed again. Lydia looked around the cave. The opening faced perhaps a little west of due south. It let in plenty of sunlight. The cavern widened further in from the entrance, then tapered many metres back. It was warm inside, and it smelt of dragon. The smell had the electric tang of magic, the thickness of scorching, and the odd creaminess of reptilian skin. There was no sign of dragon dung, but there were a few scattered bones and tusks. This dragon was more houseproud than some of her friends. It was late afternoon. Daylight would last a couple more hours. Lydia thought she should try to grab some sleep while she could. She didn't understand why the dragon had curled up and gone to sleep. Would it prove to be nocturnal? She didn't want to go a whole day and night awake. Without her rucksack she had neither food nor drink. Perhaps she could persuade her host to let her out to collect snow for water. Not now, though. She knew from her school motto, you should never disturb a sleeping dragon. She moved to one side of the cave. Rolling up her jacket to make a pillow, she lay down to rest, hopefully to sleep. At least the dragon was an effective source of central heating when combined with the magical barrier across the entrance. She realised now that she had not felt a breath of the mountain wind since they had entered. She could not counter a dragon's magic with her own high magic. To try would rouse the dragon, and she could get herself killed. It was that the dragon seemed sensitive about its relationship with the Watcher. Perhaps she could use that to her advantage. That would take subtlety. She could still feel the danger of the silence that had followed her jibe about the Watcher's servant. Disconsolate, she rolled over, facing away from the entrance, and shut her eyes. Lydia could smell the sea on the fresh breeze. Her hair whipped about in the wind. She walked a short way up the slope to where she could see both the sea itself and a castle. The castle stood atop a rocky promontory. It too was looking at the sea. She felt a jump of delight in her centre, realising that it was not the watcher's ruin she had seen so many times in her dreams. This was no ruin. No trees replaced a fallen roof. This was a castle with banners, the smoke of warming fires, and life. Guards looked out over the battlements. Inside would be cooks and servants, knights and squires. Dogs would lie on the rush-matted floor by the feasting tables, waiting for scraps of the meat they had smelled roasting for hours. Lydia longed to be there with the people and the talk and the thronging vitality. She heard a creak of leather behind her and turned. The knight in dark streaked silvery armour she had seen at the Watcher's Castle was standing there. He looks tarnished, she thought, a tarnished sentinel. He lifted the visor on his helmet. His face was young and beautiful, though around his eyes he looked careworn and older. Hello again, she said with a smile. Is that your castle? It was once, he admitted. I served a great king there, and his knights served me. I long to go there as much as you do. It looks like it ought to be cold there, perched over the sea, Lydia observed. But I can almost feel the warmth from here. Its people give it its warmth, the knight explained. Its people give it its strength also. Just as your people give you your warmth and your strength. You must remember your people, all of them. Remember your crown and scepter. 
The knight removed his gauntlet and held her hand. His skin was warm and softer than she would have expected. She noticed the heraldic symbol on his breastplate. It was unusual. The symbol showed a dragon and a tiger either side of a long sword. The odd thing was that you never saw tigers on heraldic devices. She was not sure whether medieval people even knew about tigers. She looked up at his face. He was giving her a benevolent smile. This little sojourn with your new friend, the green dragon, has to end, he intoned. Time marches on, and the watcher gathers his army. Green dragons are never to be trusted, as you know. Perhaps the watcher places too much faith in this dragon. With luck, if you were to leave, she might not follow you. Such is her displeasure with the watcher at this moment. I can't leave, she protested. There's a barrier across the cave entrance. Look for a messenger, the knight said. Your people will show you the way.